I'm laying under Rickard in the back seat of a taxi somewhere in the northwest corner of Ukraine. It's totally black outside and the road is bumpy. We, five elderly men, don't have a clue where we're going to, but I am happy. Even if I suspect that the taxi driver is taking us somewhere far out in the countryside. We arrive at a Soviet-inspired hotel. The woman in the reception takes the lead four stores up and gives us a five-bedroom with a huge fridge that doesn't work. In the morning, we wake up to a rather big city with hotels, banks, a theater, and bumpy roads. This is the way we have been traveling the last 13 summers in Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldavia, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Hungary, Slovakia, Turkey, Georgia, Armenia, Nagorno Karabakh. Just listen to it. Nagorno Karabakh. Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Gono, Abidjan, Peru, Nepal, and India. We call this way of traveling SOS, Soul on the Spot. We take the day as it comes and always turn to the left when we leave the bus station or the airport. <laughs> and isn't this the way you also want to travel? And this is how it works. It all started with Eddie, who got a major brain disease, but he survived. But it gave a psychological effect. He realized he wasn't immortal. So what he had to do has to be done now. So he called four of his friends and we said, let's go. So, is there a method to travel this way? The first journey we made was to Machu Picchu. And we realized how fun and easy it was. And we longed for more. And then I started to think about the method. And this is how it works. We decide as little as possible. We meet in a restaurant in Stockholm in December. Italo brings his school atlas. We decide where to go and meet the next summer for takeoff. Oh. We are five. We are not a couple. And we are not a big group. So we can share our burdens and, if needed, rest from each other. We always say yes. If Eddie goes to the left, we follow him. Because neither of us do know a better way. And as we are five, we can't take a cab. Okay, we can, as you heard in the beginning. But we avoid it because we are five. So we travel with buses, trains and machurkas, as local people does. We are old. We got grey hair, grey beard. So no one is afraid of us, and it gives respect in most countries, except for perhaps Sweden or Norway. We love homestaying, and if we can't sleep in people's homes, we share a room in a cheap hotel or in a hostel. And we stand still. Because if you stand here, always someone is coming to ask you, can I help you? And we say yes. For example, in Romania once, in Transylvania, you know where Dracula lives, we took the bus on the main road, it stopped in a rather small city, we longed for the mountains, so we asked for the bus station. We found the station, but no buses. We stood there, two men came to us, and probably we asked them where's the bus station, because we talked to people, even if we don't know the language. They left us and went on the other side of the square and then suddenly started to wave. So we went over the square and there was a man in a dacha, you know, the small Romanian cars. And we managed to get into the car, the rucksacks in the back, and we went off. And the man, the driver, was constantly speaking while driving with only one hand because he didn't have a left hand. 
So probably he told us the story of how he lost his hand, but we don't know. <laughs> we arrived in the village, it was getting dark. We went out, no people there. But me and Italo saw a sign, bar. So they opened the door, came in, and asked the woman between the, the desk, can we sleep here, dormi, schlafen, even in Italian, because Italo is the Italian speaker? Mm, just nothing. Well, we stood there. After some minutes, two men waved their hands in the bar. And we thought, OK, they're telling us to follow them. So we did, through the empty village, stopping with the house. They went in. After a while, they came up with a bottle and five glasses. We sat down, poured it up. It was Slibovic, the worst thing you can drink ever, as you know. And then a woman came out from the door and said, hello, I'm Christina, what do you want? Oh, we want to sleep, we want to eat, is it possible here? Of course, she said, come in. And she took us up to a beautiful room with five beds, a shower, and she asked, when do you want to eat? Oh, give us half an hour so we can change clothes and have a shower. We went down, had a beautiful dinner, local food, you know, tomatoes, salad, even her homemade wine. It tasted almost as bad as Libovic, but we didn't mind. When she left, or oh, was going to leave us, she asked, do you want anything more? Yes, of course, we said. We are used to have a fairy tale told us when we go to sleep. <laughs> oh no, she said, it's not possible. My husband is there. Morning after, she had arranged with her grandfather with an old Soviet-inspired military car to take us up to the mountains. Another rule when we go out is we have a cashier, a cashier that pays all. The cashier is Rickard and he pays everything from his credit card or cash and then we pay him when we get home. We love to go to the mountains to stretch our legs and to avoid the often dusty and sunny plains. Uh, once in we were traveling in the north of Turkey, you know, the south coast of the Black Sea. The bus stops, as they always do, in a crossroad. We sat in a cafe, and a small bus came. We opened the door, it's oh, about five places free. And a lot of women, of course, because everywhere the women are taking the bus. The men take the cars or sit in the cafes, as you know. The women had a lot of chickens, tomatoes and boxes, and so we went high up on the mountains and we loved to be there. But, of course, the same story, the bus is stopping, where to go now? But Italo has brought his little turkey map and point on the city, we want to go there. No problem. The next bus comes and we go. But it stops in, in the countryside, in a valley, with a, it was a beautiful landscape, and they wanted us to get off. We didn't understand a word what they said. But we heard a voice from the in front of the bus saying, are there any problems? Yes, we want to sleep, we want to have food, we want to go somewhere. No problem, he said. You can come with the bus till it ends, because there are hotels and restaurants. Yes, the bus went up, we went off to another empty village, of course. So we said to the man, what is this? No hotels, no restaurants. What will we do? Come with me. I'm living, we're living with a friend here, he will arrange rooms for you and he'll arrange food, of course. Done. In the evening we went out in the village and we saw a mosque and a minaret. And Eddie said, I've never been up to a minaret before. Let's try it. So we knocked on the door, the imam opened, well, big, big man, and we asked, uh, could we get up to the minaret? Yes, 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 yes. So we climbed up, it was very, very narrow. You know, I'm not very thick, but I was so narrow. We went up, beautiful view, and down again. And we asked the imam, how is it possible for you to climb up and down several times a day saying prayer? No problem. And he pointed on the tape recorder on the wall and just, okay, that was his way of saying prayer. <laughs> we went down and told our friends where we were staying. Okay, tomorrow we leave, when does the bus leave? No, 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 they said, it's, you can't leave. 
we are stuck here in the north of Turkey in a small village. You must go to paradise. Yeah, yeah, paradise, you know, with virgins and so on. Oh, no, 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 it's looked at our faces. The paradise is a village next to here with hotels, restaurants and every service. You can't go leave here, not go there. Next morning, we sat there having breakfast and they told us there's a driver here in, in this village taking you there. The driver came, it was of course the imam. He was also the taxi driver of the village. <laughs> We went into his car, went higher up again, where the uh, road ended. And he said, OK, wait here. I'll pick you up next day at the same time. And the boy opened the door of the car and said, hello, welcome. Yes, we thought. English-speaking people. It's all, you know, it's convenient when you can talk to people. So the boy took the lead in a beautiful valley with creeks, flowers, high trees. And we came to a small house, a rather small house, up a ladder into the kitchen and out on the balcony. And we had tried to talk to the kid. He didn't understand it. He, oh, oh, he said, hello, welcome. But we met his father, his mother, his sister, his brother, all sitting staring at us when we had our food. And we tried to say, where do we going to live? We saw no hotels, of course. And we had a room with, this time, six beds, one spare, and a shower. We went up to the mountains, had a good time, had dinner. We had breakfast next day. All the village was gathered around our breakfast table, looking at us. And we sat there eating. It was very nice food, but it was kind of an awkward situation. We met the imam. He took us to the city we really, or, or really wanted to for the first time. But he stopped outside and said, no, I want the money. I want, we wondered why, until we arrived in the city where the other taxi drivers were. Of course, he didn't want to show that Imam was a kind of a black taxi driver. So, with an open mind and talking to people and trusting them, this is a, a way to go. But, are there no disadvantages or dangers in traveling this way? Yes, it is. You can end up building a school home in northwestern Nepal. Once Hans rounded Kailash mountain in Tibet, and on his way home, he met the monk Shembal, sitting on the wall outside the monastery of Yalbang. And of course, Hans start, stopped and talked to him. And Shembal asked Hans for help to build a school home for the poorest children in Humla district. Because they're so far between the villages there that there's not a chance to go walk to school there and back in the same day, if there are any schools. Now we've been there four times. Uh, we arrived with an airplane to a tiny airstrip in the Himalayas. There, then there are three days walking from there. A narrow path and very steep path. Everything has to be carried by yaks, goats, horses and men, of course. The first time we got there, we put up our tents on a place the villages had prepared for us where we could build the school home. So, that's where it started. Now, there are 50 children going there in our school home. They get free food, free clothing, free school material, and of course, a bed. And this summer, we're going to expand with 20 more children. We build a new house. And we are now, or we have been teaching or they educated five of the villages to plant trees. So there will be cherries and apples growing there, bringing vitamins and food for the people. And even the next step is to plant trees for construction and firewood. So we are helping to reforest the Himalayas, thanks to open minds traveling together.
Next month, we will meet in the restaurant again. Italo has promised to bring his atlas. Thank you. Oh, so, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I just, uh, when you travel SOS like we do, always pee when someone wants to. You never know when and where the bus <laughs> will stop next time.